All right, Luke chapter 15 this morning. Let's read it together here, starting in verse 1. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, doesn't light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I've found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's pray. Lord, I uh, ask this morning that you would meet us here and that your spirit would be active among us in our hearts and minds, helping us to understand and then receive the things that you have for us, Lord. We pray that you would impress upon us more of who you are, that we might... Um, see the beauty of the character of God in our own lives and in our um, perception of you. And I pray that we would be um, enriched in our understanding of Scripture and blessed with your presence. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. You ever um, lost something that was important to you? I guess we've all lost something before of varying levels of importance. But that's what we're going to be talking about today. And before I get started, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, relationships, particularly our relationship with God, but in, in general sense, um, the relationship that we have with other people really comes down to knowing that person. Um, to have a deep relationship with somebody is to know them well. <laughs> Uh, you think about the depth of relationship that you might enjoy with a spouse or a best friend or a child. It's in getting to know that individual and spending time with that individual. Um, kind of knowing what makes them tick, what they like, what they don't like, what they're passionate about, what they're apathetic toward, all those things. And in our relationship with God, it's no different. We are alienated from Him by birth until we come to some sort of an understanding, some sort of a, well, what the Bible would call a uh, conversion of soul, a regeneration, and, and we're introduced then to this God that we didn't know before, and so then the rest of our life is really a discovery of who this God is in reality. We probably came into the relationship with a lot of preconceived ideas, but as we go along, we learn the more of the truth about God and come to a clearer understanding of who He is and what He's like, and we delight in that. And there's also a sense in which we open ourselves up to God to be known by Him. And in that process, the relationship is deepened and our appreciation for the Lord just continues to grow. And so this morning we're going to see some things about God that He wants us to see about Him because had He not disclosed this information, we might have otherwise gone our entire life without really knowing. Particularly, it's the joy that He feels when a sinner repents. I mean, this, this has to be one of the greatest joys of God, as it's explained here. And that's something that we might overlook, that God feels joy, that He experiences joy. And He wants us to know that about Him, that those things that were to Him so precious were lost, and then He sets out on a mission to find that which was lost, and when He recovers the lost, He is rejoicing. And all of heaven rejoices with him. So this is something that we can learn about the Lord. So I come back to the original question, have you ever lost anything that was important to you? And furthermore, how did you react? And depending on your reaction, I think we could sort of conclude how much it meant to you, that thing that was lost. Did you panic? Did you turn the room upside down? Did you call for help? Did you kind of text some friends and get a prayer chain started, you know, that kind of thing? Oh, I can't find my keys. Well, if not, then it didn't mean that much to you. 
you know, okay, you lost a receipt. No big deal. You don't inform anybody. You don't pray about it. There's no panic. There's no turning the room upside down. It probably didn't mean that much to you. And that's the point. Jesus wants us to understand that it is a big deal. Sinners getting saved is a huge deal to him. And so he's turning the world upside down. In a very real sense, the world has been turned upside down so that in his time and beyond, all over the face of the earth, his presence is still being talked about today. In the short time that he had a public ministry, in the few years that he was alive on this earth, he did much to stir cultures over the entire globe. And it's been happening for 2,000 years since. His presence is being felt. Why? Because he's still at work what, doing what? He's on mission to save those that are lost. And he wants us to see how important lost people are to him. Lost people are really, 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 really important to Christ. They're near and dear to the heart of God, even though they've been alienated from Him. He really cares a lot. Even despicable, hard to love, impossible to appreciate kind of people. And He wants us to understand that. So He puts it in terms that we can understand. He says, in a sense, well, people are as important to me as money is to some of you. Does that help? Does that help you understand how I feel about this? Hey, maybe it ain't money for you, but whatever it is, think of whatever it is that is most precious to you and then imagine losing it. Think of how you'd react if you lost it. I don't know what it was. Your wallet, your keys, your passport. Your child? Think about that. What if somebody you love was kidnapped? Think of the immediate panic you'd feel, the desperation you'd feel. Think of the determination you would have to find them. Imagine the effort you're suddenly willing to put forth and the commitment you'd have to look for it and the sacrifice you'd be willing to make in order to recover that lost thing. Think of the singular focus an individual has when they're in that position. The dramatic measures that they would take. Think of the increasing number of people they'd involved in the process. You know how it goes. You've seen the news. A child is turned up missing. The, the parents make an appeal to the city police and then the entire community and then the state and nation, if they can, they get as many people to join the search party as possible. And then multiply that by billions and you might begin to grasp how important it is for God to save the lost. But you'd have to take all of that and multiply it by billions because that's how God feels. So to read in today's passage that he rejoices when at least one of them is found shouldn't be too far of a stretch. Think of what it's like when you finally find your wallet or your keys or your whatever it is that you've lost. And you find it. What's your reaction? Ah, oh, I found it. Hey, I found it. It was down here. Right? You call all your friends, tell you you can quit praying for me. Thanks. I got it. Right? Imagine then God's joy when a sinner repents. The joy that is felt when something is found is in direct correlation to the panic and despair they felt when it was lost. The greater the despair, then the greater joy. And the Bible tells us that God feels more joy over a saved sinner than we've ever felt in finding something we lost. And since that's true, then the corollary is also true. He feels more grief over the damned than we've ever felt for anything. Far more. And so this is God's heart. The condition of man's soul in his lost state is alarming to God. Alarming. And he's desperate to do whatever it will take to find them.
He is including more people in that process as time goes along. If you're a Christian today, you have joined the search party. Seek and save along with Jesus who has lost something of such great value to him, which is eternal souls of those who are living without him. He's deeply alarmed. God's singular focus seems to be the redemption of mankind. I mean, if he is willing to sacrifice his own son for the cause, then I guess that means God means business, doesn't he? Right? He's willing to make whatever sacrifice is necessary. We were created in his image, and then we were kidnapped, and then we were brainwashed. That's mankind in a nutshell. Created in God's image. In other words, we resembled him like a child resembles his parent. You kind of see your own features in their little face. It's an indication that we are precious to him on that basis alone, made in his image. And then we were kidnapped, taken captive by Satan to do his will, and then brainwashed into believing that God is the bad guy and that our sin is justified. I can't imagine the heartbreak of having that occur in my own life. A kidnapping and then a brainwashing to turn what was mine against me. And God will not relent. What's most precious to him has been lost and with greatest determination and purpose God is on mission to seek and save that which was taken. So, why is it then so important to Jesus? Not, we get that it's important for him to save the lost. <clears throat> but why is it important for him to know, rather, why is it so important that we know how strongly he feels about saving the lost? In other words, yeah, he's really intent on saving sinners, but why is he really intent on showing us how much he feels about saving sinners. Why do we need to know that? Why, why, why is it that he is telling these people how much rejoicing there is in heaven over the repentance of a sinner? Why do we have to know that? Several reasons. But I think it's interesting that here that Jesus is telling us how he feels. Isn't that, is that interesting to you? Jesus is telling us how he feels. Hey, man, it's okay if tax collectors and sinners are drawing near to me to hear me because I want to save them. And do you know how I feel about that? If one of these tax collectors and sinners repented of their sins, do you know how I feel about that? Let me tell you how I feel when that actually happens. Here's how I feel. And it's, it's interesting to me that Jesus today is telling us how he feels about something because typically in America, well, Christianity seems to be all about God knowing how I feel. Well, God, this makes me feel. Well, God, don't you know how I feel? And God, my feelings... And today Jesus is going, this is how I feel. So some people, including the Pharisees and the scribes here, need to get over how they feel and start understanding how Jesus feels. Because some of us, I mean, listen, we get so wrapped up in how we feel about stuff. I'll tell you that Christians in America, and I'm picking on Americans again, but I can because I'm one, are so sensitive, hypersensitive when it comes to the things of God. And it's like something stings or something said, and oh, I'm offended, and that bothers me, and I don't like it, and everybody should change except for me. Accommodate, accommodate. And it's like, no, Jesus is going, but I have feelings too. So if this is going to be a battle of feelings, then we've got a problem because I'm very passionate about this. I love people and I want to save them and, and I don't like your grumbling, Pharisees. They're grumbling, they're complaining. Why? Because Jesus loves people, including tax collectors and sinners. And of course, tax collectors and sinners, that's kind of like a, a, a summary of the worst of the worst in their culture. Okay, just so you know. Tax collectors and sinners. You always see them paired up together, don't you? 
So let me try and explain a little bit of who we're talking about here when we talk about tax collectors and sinners. Despicable people. Let's just deal with tax collectors first. And I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing um, in advance for bringing up the current political, you know, uh, issues, you know, um, we just, as a country, elected uh, Donald Trump to be president over Hillary Clinton. Um, so let me use what has become such a hot issue for so many people as an illustration for how despicable tax collectors were. Okay? Um, in this last election, the candidate you voted for, uh, if you voted, um, you weren't actually voting for the candidate, just so you know. You were actually voting for the one who would actually then vote for the candidate. Um, it's called the Electoral College. These are delegated representatives of each state who will, according to the popular vote of the state, get to, on December 19th, go to their state capital and cast their vote for the president. So the president is elected not because of your vote, but because of their vote. You are voting to let the party, whether Republican or Democrat, vote on your preferred behalf. So, Minnesotans, we lost. It's Hillary. But every other state, they got their choice. Okay? Wisconsin, I think, was Trump. Minnesota was, was blue. You can look on a chart. So all the blue states, they lost. They didn't get their way. All the red states did. However, it's the delegates that end up making the vote. So now everybody in, let's say, Wisconsin who wants Trump to be president is counting on their number of delegates to vote in Madison on December 19th, Trump. You following me? Okay? Now let's say, and I think if I'm getting the numbers right, um, Trump will have perceivably 290 delegates nationwide voting for him. Hillary will have, I think, 228 delegates nationwide voting for her. That's a difference of 62. Half of that is 31. Let's say that it's 32 Trump delegates change their mind and vote Hillary. She becomes the next president. Now you've got 32 traitors. How do you believe all of the Trump fans in this country are going to feel about those 32 traitors? They were supposed to vote Republican, and now they're actually on the side of the one that we hate. This would be, I bet you there would be some real um, nastiness happening. I mean, the election alone has generated a bit of nastiness. I mean, people are rioting, there's verbal hostility, you know, across the board, violence probably in some corners. And so you can get the idea of how much hatred can be built around political issues. That's the very same thing that's happening with these tax collectors because Israel was living under Roman oppression and a tax collector was a Jew who would sell out and pay in to the Roman government to be hired by the Roman government to take taxes from their own people. And the way that they made money was by taking more taxes than were due and then they keep off the top. So if you think there would be some real hostility in our country if like the Republicans actually lost after the popular vote had already been cast, then we'd see riots. We're already seeing riots. Imagine if there were traitors involved. And so now you've got this, this thing happening in Israel where this hated Roman government was in control. And then you've got people who are supposed to be on our side cashing in and switching sides and oppressing me. Dude, you're my neighbor. How dare you? This is your fault. I mean, Romans are Romans. They'll always be Romans. But you, you're supposed to be a Jew and you're on their side now? They were absolutely hated. Worst of the worst. And then there's sinners. Sinners is kind of a catch-all 
for those individuals in their own uh, communities and in their own country who are recognized nationwide as being deplorable. So every country has certain sins in, in people that they won't morally tolerate. It's hard in America because we're morally tolerant of almost everything in this country. Uh, everything from drunkenness to uh, homosexuality to uh, abortion to um, even drug use, like hard drug use, is becoming way more culturally acceptable than it's ever been in history. Although it's still counted criminal. Um, it's not as big of a deal as it was. I will tell you there are still some sins that our culture recognizes as deplorable, um, but they're becoming less and less. A few of those might be kidnapping, sex trading, pedophilia, and murder. Okay, Those we won't embrace yet. If you embrace pedophilia, come on. You, you're doing it secretly. If you embrace the sex trade and kidnapping, you're keeping it quiet, I can guarantee you. You're not like the homosexuals or the transgenders or the... You're not parading yourself and going, you need to tolerate this. And, you, and then the whole culture backs you and applauds you. Okay? Our culture isn't turned on those issues yet. However, I do believe that in time we will. I do believe that some of the most atrocious sins that we count as evil today will in a few decades be acceptable and tolerable and those who are intolerant of them still will be the ones who are condemned kind of like anybody who still takes a stand against homosexuality which by the way in 1974 was according to the american medical journal a um, mental disorder and in 40 quick years we switched our philosophy on that entirely now if you don't agree with it and you don't believe in it you're the one with the mental disorder you're a Christian freak, that's what you are. And so it's coming, but there are still things in our country that we hold as morally wrong. Now, when we're talking about sinners, we're talking about those kinds of people. People who the entire culture would recognize as wrong, sick, and wicked. And when these kinds of people are drawing near to Jesus, these traitors, these tax collectors, these people are on the wrong side of the political line. And these, for illustration's sake, these pedophiles, these kidnappers, murderers, and they're drawing near to Jesus, and Jesus is okay with that? There's something, something disturbing about that, that God's all right. That God, pure and holy, is okay with people like that drawing near to Him. There should be a problem there. We don't like this at all. And you know what's interesting is, in their day, it was the Pharisees that were looking at the tax collectors and going, they don't get to draw near to God. Sinners don't get to draw near to God. And in our day, I think it would be more along the line of the sinners looking down their nose at the self-righteous and going, they don't get to draw near to God. Because we know God loves tax collectors and sinners. Either way, what we need to understand this morning is that no matter what camp you belong to, we all have the tendency to go a little too tax collector in our heart, a little too sinful. But we also, in the same, in the same week, can go back the other way and become a little bit pharisaic as well. We can kind of dance between the two, just so you know. Well... At any rate, it's the tax collectors and the sinners that are drawing near to hear him. You know what's interesting? What did the verse just before that one say? The last verse of chapter 14. Jesus' closing remark when he gave his little sermonette there. Right? It's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. And then his last statement. He who has ears, let him hear. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Who has ears to hear? Sometimes it's the worst of the worst. Sometimes there's, they're, 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 they're the only ones that'll listen. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And sometimes it, that's you when you're at your worst. Do you get it? Sometimes the only time you'll really hear God, or sometimes at times you hear Him the greatest, or, or, or want to hear Him, is when you're at your worst and you know it. Here's these tax collectors and sinners. It's like they know. They know they're hated. They know they got problems. And now they have 
the right ears to hear what Jesus might have to say. And what's interesting is that the Pharisees don't. The scribes don't. Why? They think they're doing fine. They think they're a step up from the uh, tax collectors. We're not like they are. Why would God include himself in their affairs? This doesn't make sense. And so why is it then that Jesus turns his attention here to the Pharisees and speaks these parables? Right? Because they're all complaining. Oh, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. So he spoke this parable because they were complaining. That's why he spoke the parable. He wants to teach them. Why is it that Jesus is so concerned about us knowing how strongly he feels about saving the lost? Why do we need to know how he feels? Why does he want us to know how he feels? One is so that they won't, that we won't, he doesn't, we, so that we won't prevent his work in the world. Us misunderstanding and complaining about the work of God is a hindrance to his mission. It actually hinders his mission. Us not being on board, us being apathetic, us being contradictory. And Jesus wants us to know how he feels because he wants his work to go on and he doesn't want us to be a hindrance to this. If you look further, I believe that Jesus wants us to know how he feels about this so that we can also partake of the work that he's doing. I don't think Jesus is just going, you know what, you Pharisees, you guys suck. Here's a parable to show you how much you suck. Can't stand you guys. I don't think he's doing that at all. I think he's showing them this through the parable so that they can get on board with what he's doing. I don't think, listen, I don't think Jesus would have any problem at all if a Pharisee went, you know what, Jesus, you're right. I should be more excited about your work in this world. I want to help. You think Jesus would be like, nope. Forget it. Can't stand you guys. Didn't like you before, don't like you now. He wouldn't do that at all. He'd be like, awesome. I came to seek and save that which was lost, and today it was a Pharisee. There's more rejoicing in heaven right now over this. So Jesus is just as adamant about saving the Pharisee that he's kind of rebuking undercover, sort of like, through a parable, as he is about the tax collector and sinner who is overtly in the wrong. He's ministering to them both right now. He's not indiscriminate. He, he, or rather, he is dis indiscriminate. He doesn't care who comes to him so long as they come to him. He doesn't care who's lost so that there's, they're found. If we've been found, we've been given quite a unique opportunity, and it's to participate in the work of God and share his joy over the saving of the lost. Because God enlisted us to participate in his plan to reconcile the world to himself. Remember how I said, you know, when you lose something, you end up, you know, calling your spouse into the room, I can't find it, help me look for it. And then maybe some other people, and pretty soon you're calling people, and pretty soon you got a search party going, you know, that kind of thing. And God has been working to increase the numbers of the search party since he began this mission. And you and I have been um, sort of uh, enlisted, I guess, uh, to become part of his greater team. And we're out to seek and save the lost, right along with Christ. And doing that work is quite a privilege. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, All of this is from God, who has through Christ reconciled us to himself, and then given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's our mission in this world. Well, that's God's mission, but he's kind of enlisted us to join the search team. And so these guys here won't join the team. They just sit aside and critique the mission. And they're bothered that Jesus would receive sinners and have lunch with tax collectors and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes we can get that critical heart 
And when we do, we actually oppose his work rather than to cooperate with him in it. And when we're opposed to the work of God, we really decrease our fruitfulness or limit our fruitfulness or like actually prevent our fruitfulness. And another thing that we do is we prevent God's pleasure because God, God is really adamant about uh, seeing the, the lost saved. Third reason here why Jesus wants us to know how he feels is simply that we would take pleasure in his work. And the last thing I want to do is help him in it and not take pleasure in it. And guys, this could end up being an issue for some of us if it hasn't already, and certainly we'll struggle with this from time to time. But last week we learned that it will be joy. It will be that deep-seated joy that a person feels upon salvation that will carry them through a life of obedience, a life of cross-carrying, a life of striving and, and opposing the world and standing strong in their faith. A life of that is predicated upon a moment of joy. And so the last thing I want to do is participate in the work of God and just kind of like not like it, sort of be drained by it. And you notice here that in both cases, in verse 6 and in verse 9, both of the individuals who lost what was, or who found what was lost, actually calls their neighbors and their friends, and they want to share in the rejoicing with others. And God feels that same way. He wants to share the joy that he feels over saving sinners and reconciling the lost back to God. He wants to share that joy with us. And I said it either Sunday or Wednesday, but the whole idea of joy is that it's not meant to be experienced in isolation. Joy is never meant to be experienced alone. It's always meant to share, and we see it here twice over. They called their friends and their neighbors and said, let's rejoice, we should party. Now imagine if God calls up you know, somebody and says, let's rejoice, somebody just got saved, and the person on the other line is like, oh, so what? You know, I'm busy. Well, yep, yeah, that's nice, okay, good, cool. But, um, you know, is the football game on? You know? I got, I got other things that I'm kind of wrapped up in right now. I'm, you know what I'm really rejoicing in? I got a raise. Jesus is like, I saved somebody. And we're like, I, I, yeah, cool. I got a raise. I, I, just, I just bought, I, I bought a new outfit. Like, what excites us? What is it that really gets us? And Jesus is going, there's one thing that gets me going. It's saving the lost. And I'm like, man, I want that to be my heart. I want there to be no greater joy for me than to see lost being saved, to, be, to see sinners repenting of sin. And yet I'm ashamed to say that there are some things in life from time to time that get my greater attention. They are cause for greater celebration. And what a shame that is. And honestly, what a waste of life that is. If there is anything else that gets greater response from you than the saving of souls, if there's anything that gets greater energy or attention, if there's something else that would cause greater sorrow for you than that people are dying and going to hell, then there's something amiss. There's something amiss. We're being distracted by something. Our affections are being given to something other than what God would have our affections be given to. And that is called idolatry. And that, according to the Bible, is a pretty big sin. And so we need to look and go, my heart needs to be what God's heart is. And that's why Jesus is telling us this morning how he feels about stuff so that we can see where we're misaligned and then be brought back into line with who God is. May his heart become our heart and may our heart always be his. He's going, this is what I'm jacked up about. Is that, is, that what, is that what turns you? Is that what really gets you moving in the morning? Is that what motivates you to get out of bed? Because this is what gets me going. And honestly, at any given moment, that's probably not the case for everybody here. And again, I already admitted to you, there are times where I get distracted there are times where my affections are being stolen, kind of pulled into something that's just really frivolous. This was temporary, you know, worldly. Pulled into a direction of something that, in the end, is just not going to come with me to heaven, and it's not going to bring glory to God. I can get excited about stupid stuff. I'm probably better at it than some of you guys. I can get really excited about stupid stuff. I really can. And yet Jesus here comes this morning and says, Hey, I need to remind you of something. 
I don't get excited about stupid stuff. The stuff I get excited about is really, really important. It's important to God, it's important to me, it's important to the Holy Spirit, and it should be important to you. Jesus would say, you know what happened when you got saved? You want to know what kind of a party we threw in heaven when you got saved? It would blow your mind. Maybe he'll show us the tape when we get there. You want to see your birthday party? This is your first birthday. Watch this. <laughs> Yeah! And there's angels like, bah! and you know, like, it's almost frightening to watch. You're like, bah! like, seriously, this was happening? You know, and to us, what, what, what kind of rejoicing was there on your behalf when you got saved? Well, to you, it was like, I love God. I don't know what it is, but I feel softer toward Him. It's like, the things I used to disagree with, I suddenly agree with. The stuff I used to be bored by, I'm suddenly interested in. It's crazy, you know, and then like, everything sort of changes in your mind and you're like, this is all new. And then God's like, yeah, when that was happening, you should have seen up here. It w we went nuts. You thought Cubs in the World Series was a big deal? We went ballistic. Why? Because you were important to us. We've been watching you for a long time. It was like losing a kid. Seeing you out there by yourself all those years. Being brainwashed by the world. It was hard. We kept our cool. But don't believe that there wasn't a whole lot of turmoil. We were in knots. In fact, we saw it coming, and so we set this ball rolling years before you were even born. And then God the Father is going to step up and go, that's why I sent my son, you know. And then the Holy Spirit's going to step up and go, that's why I was poking you so many times. God, you're stubborn. And then Jesus will step up and go, do you get it now? Do you get what this was all for? And do you get why we get so excited for stuff like this? Do you get why we made the effort and then asked you to make the effort? But the thing is, is I don't, I don't want to waste my life waiting to get to heaven to find out how significant it was to him. Like, oh, it was a big deal to you? Oh, oh, okay. And Jesus doesn't want you to waste your life waiting for you to get to heaven to find out how significant all of this was. That's why he wrote Luke 15. You want to know how I feel? Jesus would have you know this morning how he feels about this. Because we know how we feel about this. How do we feel about scheduling another outreach, scheduling another workday, doing another mailer? How do we feel about doing this all over again next week? Sunday service, Wednesday service, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. How do we feel about that? I know how we feel. I know how you feel. I know you get discouraged, and I, you know, I know you get weary, and I know you get disappointed, and I know that you get disheartened, and I know that you get sometimes a little bit um, hostile in your heart. You get a little bit, a little animosity, a little bit of kind of like, mm, I get that. I've felt it too. But today Jesus wants us to know how he feels. So that we'll carry on so that we do this for his sake, not for our sake. Because this is a big deal to him. I get that. And I want it to be a big deal to us. I want this to be our joy. Serving Jesus and saving the lost. I think it's interesting here that Jesus doesn't rebuke in this passage. And he could have, by the way. You know what I'm saying? People are coming to Jesus and people are getting saved and they're like, in all humility, just innocently coming to Christ and going, I'm sinful, but you'll hear me, you'll have me. And then somebody else standing by and going, it's a bunch of, what a jerk, eating with these people. Can't he see who these people, sick. 
Jesus has every right to rebuke these people. You know what I'm saying? And he doesn't. He teaches them patiently. He has to do it through a parable, kind of dilute the truth a little bit. Not that it's any less true, it's just less concentrated. You know, so here's a parable for you because they can't handle the straight truth. Some people just, they're going to balk at it. You give them undiluted truth, they'll only bristle at it. I think I have a tendency to do that and people bristle because it's just, just here it is, you know. I don't have a whole lot of tact. By the way, I've never, I've never been one for a whole lot of diplomacy. You know, I'm not real good at that. I just, here's what the Bible says, and then, you know, everybody's like, God. But Jesus here, he's using parables. Why? Because he doesn't want to drive you away with the undiluted truth. You know why? Because he cares about you too. He cares about the Pharisees just as much as he cares about the sinners. And, and so he gives them a parable and then leaves them to conclude their own guilt. I mean, he taught this parable in such a way that these Pharisees must have gone away knowing that they, he was talking about them. And so it's clear, the message is, they're the guilty ones. And so now they're in a position, aren't they? Jesus kind of leaves them in, in this spot where they need to either come to grips with the guilt that they own and repent of their sin and seek his forgiveness and become the cause for rejoicing in heaven or they can harden their heart and they can die in their own sin. These parables here that Jesus teaches aren't meant to condemn the tax collectors and sinners, but the ones who believe themselves to be better than the tax collectors and sinners. It really, it's just an issue of superiority. When we think that we're more deserving of God's love, more deserving of His grace than somebody else, and we're not. You know what? Every one of us in this room is on the same playing field in the sense that we None of us deserve it. None of us deserve His love. None of us deserve His mercy or grace. None of us has done anything to earn it. We don't get saved because we're cute. We don't get saved because we're smart. We don't get saved because we have potential. We get saved in spite of the fact that we're none of those things. And God is good for that. We're all lost until we're found, and not a day earlier. We're all hopelessly lost until we're found. No one finds their own way out of this sinful mess. No lost sheep comes to their senses and goes, I gotta find the group. Um, sheep are notoriously stupid. They will wander away from the pack and then they will bleat bleat after the pack that they've wandered away from and still run in the opposite direction ah! they're just stupid stupid and helpless sheep are notoriously helpless um, sheep will lie down as is common among animals and if they rock back too far, their center of gravity shifts and it pops their legs up. And once their legs are popped up, they can't get back up. And so they'll eventually just roll over, legs in the air. That cuts off the blood circulation to their limbs. And they'll kick and kick and kick and it builds up gas. And, uh, and they're just miserable. Just miserable. Hey, I, I know another creature that's a lot like that. Us. You know, it's funny to me that of all the animals in the kingdom, God decided to associate humans with sheep. It's like the lessons are numerous and unavoidable and humbling. 
God doesn't call us stupid and helpless. He just calls us sheep. And then we're supposed to put the pieces together. <laughs> You're sheep! Do some research. <laughs> we're in great need of a shepherd. We need to be found. And being found after having been so lost makes our salvation that much more profound. When me and Sarah moved up to the Twin Ports to start a church, that very first winter I lost my wedding ring, my, my original one. This one's a cheap silver ring that I got in India for like $10. But my original one was fat, gold, diamond studded. I mean, no. It was just a cheap gold band, but uh, I got it at a I think I got it at the Truckers Union, that head shop. I think I did in Eau Claire. Um, and uh, then I had her ring made, and I engraved um, the first half of the verse, um, what God has joined together, and then let no man separate. Each of our rings had one half of that verse engraved into it. So, you know, my ring was had sentimental value. Um, well, that first winter, I got snow up my sleeve. I was cleaning off the car or doing something, and I shook the snow out of my sleeves. And then later that day, I realized my ring was gone. And uh, it hurt. It hurt more than losing a random piece of jewelry or something, because there was that sentimental value attached to it. And, uh, and it almost bothered me, like, God, that's not symbolic of what my marriage will become, is it? Like, is this is some spiritual significance I have? You know, and so I'm kind of tied up in knots about that. And um, the, the monetary value of the ring was no, no thought at all. It was the sentimental, it was the emotional component that drove me to look everywhere I could. That was a very snowy winter, and it was deep. And I looked all over my yard, all over the neighbor's yard, all over the road, both sides of the road. I rented a metal detector. I scoured and scoured and scoured, and I never found it. <laughs> you a little wrapped up in it, are you? Yeah, I know. Me too. At any rate, after, what, eight years, if it turned up now, I'd be through the roof. I'd be like, my ring! <laughs> Check the engraving. It is! All of that to illustrate the fact that there is so much joy to be had after having been so lost. I'm not expecting to get my wedding ring back, and that's really not the point of the illustration. The point of the illustration is that God has immense joy that's bound up right now in the saving of souls that are all but hopelessly lost. And yet he maintains a glimmer of hope that it may happen. And when it does, big birthday party. And that's the heart of God. And I want that to be the heart of this church. That in everything we do, we do with that and is our objective, to seek and save the lost. Okay, let's never get caught up in the trivial things. Let's love people and share Jesus with them, that our joy may be complete, that we may um, participate with Him in the work. If there's one thing that's missing in the lives of many Christians, it's doing something. But there's a lot of Christians out there who are living their life as a Christian with nothing to really do with it. What sets our church apart from many others, not all, but many, is that we will give you something to do with your Christianity.